Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Exergy Energy's weekly cast of all things energy. Uh, today is super, super exciting for me because we have the opportunity to talk about the first new generator technology that has come to market, I'm going to say, in the last 50 or 60 years. And people are going to say, wait a second, wait a second, we've got, you know, fuel cells, we've got you know, um, PV panels and things like that. First photo cell, first PV was 1955. NASA has been putting fuel cells on space vehicles for the last 40, 50, 60 years. There really hasn't been anything new in the generator market until today. So this is exciting for me and I hope for you as well. So today we're speaking with Mainspring Energies and we're going to uh, go into the details on technology, applications, and things like that. Apologies in advance, since this is a live cast on LinkedIn, there's no questions or chat or anything. So if you've got questions, please put them in the comments section, and I absolutely guarantee that we will get back to you. Uh, it is also being recorded. So if you want your friends and family or somebody to watch it later, it will be on the LinkedIn page. So uh, enjoy. So without further ado, we have Wassam and Jeff joining us from Mainspring today. I'm going to turn it over to you guys. Introduce yourself and then give us a little bit of a background of the company. And then I'm going to start pummeling you with questions about the product and technology. So I'll turn it over to you, Wassam. Thank you, David, and thank you for having, having me and Jeff with you on this weekly pro, you know, broadcast. And uh, we are actually always interested in sharing our, you know, what's happening in the market, the technology. So we will uh, share with you a lot of information on this new technology that uh, we call the linear generator. Um, and then obviously, you know, my, let's start with myself. Um, Hussein Belshi, I lead the channel development and strategic partnerships at Mainspring. I just joined them a few months ago, and uh, I spent 20 years in the power generation business, mainly distributed generation on-site power. Uh, I love the space, and I'm pretty excited to be with Mainspring and to talk to you about what Mainspring has to offer. I'll let Jeff introduce himself. Sure. Uh, hey, everyone. Jeff Wilcox. I'm a director of commercial and industrial projects uh, for Mainspring Energy. I joined the company myself um, in March of this year. So I um, spent most of my career in solar and battery um, project development. And uh, yeah, happy to be here today and uh, hope everybody learn more about this, uh, this new tech. So my background here, I picked just to annoy you all, right? This is a big reciprocating engine generator. So I thought we could use it to compare and contrast. So as I said, this is the first truly, in my opinion, truly new generation technology that has come to market in the last 50 to 60 years. So let me go to you first, Wassam. What's unique about it? How do you even describe it? to someone. So I'm going to use some slides as we speak just to explain to you how it works. Uh, we have a, an animation that Jeff's going to go over in a little bit. But what we have is a 230 kilowatt generator. Uh, the technology is not the same as your traditional, uh, you know, reset engine driven uh, generator, rotating alternator. It's actually linear right so when we go into the animation you'll see how it, how it works um, and we'll, we'll go into that in a minute or two uh, so the product is a 230 kilowatt product uh, we can run on any gaseous fuel so most of our projects use pipeline gas uh, we have we can run on propane uh, we can do hydrogen ammonia uh, so that fuel flexibility is very unique to our technology. And we can do these, you know, fuel. Uh, let me stop you there for a second. I talk to a lot of people and they'll say, yeah, our engines, they can run hydrogen, they can run biogas, they can run natural gas and everything else. But it requires me to bring a technician in and they're gonna replace the fuel, <laughs> the injectors and, and things like that. So 
is that the same with you guys? No, we can do it on the fly, right? On the so fly. you can. So yeah. I've got a, I got two two pipes here. One's natural gas, one's hydrogen. I can just swap them around. Is that what you're telling me? Well, I mean, you'll blend them, and okay. that, that you know, you can blend them. You can switch between fuels, and, and that's actually the interesting thing. You don't have to change any hardware. You don't have to change the controls. The controls will detect that change in the composition of the fuel, and it will change the compression ratio. And I think maybe this is a good good time to start explaining how it works. I have a little animation that you know sure. Jeff and I can 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 share with you. So uh, let me share this quick. Can you see my presentation? Uh, I so, can. Okay. So Jeff, do you want to maybe provide the high level, and then I'll just jump in and add to your comments. Sure. Yeah, I can. I can talk through this a little bit. So, anybody that's been this same animation, I think, is available on the website. But yeah, this is um, the linear generator. So, what we're doing is we're introducing a fuel and air mixture into a center reaction zone, and that fuel air mixture is being compressed uh, from either side uh, by an oscillator, and there is a uniform and low temperature reaction that pushes the oscillators back out. The oscillators are surrounded by magnets and copper coils, and it's that movement uh, through, through the magnets that's creating uh, electricity. On the outside of each oscillator, there's an air spring uh, that bounces, bounces it back for the next cycle. Um, the oscillators are riding on air bearings, so there is no um, oil or fluid lubrication in the system. So um, the result of all this is it's extremely high efficiency, you know, very low friction. Uh, there's also very few moving parts. Um, and because we can control uh, the compression ratio, as Wasong mentioned, uh, you know, to within the width of a piece of paper, uh, we can adjust to a variety of different fuels. All right, so let me ask a couple of questions while I'm looking at this. Um, so if I'm going to start a, a standard recip, right? I've got an alternator there with a starter engine. <laughs> it's going to spin this thing and everything else. How do you start this thing from a dead stop? So if we are working um, in parallel to the grid, you know, we would be using AC mains power for the mm -hmm. cycle. Uh, to get the compressor going. Uh, we also have a small battery uh, built into the generator, uh, so we can use that for, for Black Start. Um, so it is Black Start capable? Yes, it is. Yeah, so Black Start capable, you know, we are we have grid forming inverters. Uh, the output of the generator is 40 volt, three phase. So uh, we can be the grid forming part of a microgrid. Um, mm -hmm. We can um, you know, take signals from, from some other grid forming component. Now, with some said, um, any gaseous fuel, and looking at here, I, I see your reaction zone. What is conspicuously absent fr from typically gaseous generators is a spark plug. So how, how do you handle the combustion and the ignition in this unit? So there's actually no combustion. It's a low temperature reaction. Um, it is under 1500 degrees Celsius. And so the advantage of that is that it keeps our critical emissions extremely low. So we're not fully oxidizing the fuel. So as an example, our NOx uh, emissions are under two and a half parts per million. So when you say you're not, uh, so there's no combustion in the sense that there's no flame, flame front, or things like that, right? right. So this is really just an essentially a pressure reaction. The chemical reaction is the oxidation of the fuel, but without a flame front. Literally, it's just a, the, the chemical combination? Correct, yeah. Fascinating, fascinating. And they think, you know, the reason... That so the concept of a linear generator is not a new concept, right? It's, there has been 
research in the past and some attempts to have a linear generator. I think that the main differentiation we have in this product is how tight we control the compression in the reaction zone. And we have these sensors and controls that, you know, 20, 30 years, uh, the technology did not exist, right? So it came out of a uh, research that's in Stanford. So mm -hmm. the founders, the founders of Mainspring, uh, you know, PhD students at Stanford, they were trying to figure out how can they, uh, you know, develop a low carbon, dispatchable, resilient solution that can be used on site, like for distributed generation applications. And this is how they came up with this idea, right? They figured out a way to tightly control the, the compression in the reaction zone. And then, you know, you have these sensors in the machine as well that can detect what's going on on the fly. And you can quickly, within one or two cycles, change the compression ratio, depending on the type of fuel that you are injecting into the reaction zone, which, as far as I know, <laughs> no other technology does, at the, you know, in the market. Uh, so, so you ask the question, what's unique and different about us? So there's no combustion, right? It's uh, So it's not a combustion engine, as many people maybe think of us. And it's not, you know, the, the traditional, like, chemical reaction that you see in a fuel cell. Obviously, there is a chemical reaction that, you know, when you, when you compress the fuel and the gases, it will break up. And then when it breaks up and starts, you know, the heat starts, the expansion is what pushes the oscillators to the side. And that creates that motion, that linear motion that you see in this, in this animation. But it's, there is, it's not like a fuel cell either, right? And we don't have these stacks that you have to replace in a fuel cell every few years, right? It's the only part that we replace in this machine and that's truly consumable is we have some seals that you see in the bearings that you see on this animation. Those have to be replaced once a month. And we're working on improving that uh, duration to, to minimize the amount of you know, uh, downtime. But in, in general, it's a very quick service and you just replace that seal and you don't have to shut down the whole machine. You can replace the seal on one side and keep the, so you can really split it you know, in half. Think of it as two generators, not one, right? In that same box. You can keep 115 kilowatts running while you service the other oscillator, the other 115 kilowatts, and you know, one or two hours switch, fix the other side, and that's it. There are no stacks to replace, no oil, no you know, no filters, no spark plugs, <laughs> uh, right? So, and, and that's what's really you know one of the, I think, biggest advantages we have, and what makes us very competitive in prime power applications. That is the main use case that we're going after with this technology. Well, we'll come back to that to, to a little bit more detail. But I mean, I'm, I'm looking at this, and this is a great video. I see two moving parts. <laughs> OK, now there may be more with respect to valves and things for your, you know, uh, your, your fuel management and things like that. But I see two moving parts. This has got to be, and I'm, I'm going to make an, an assumption, this is going to be a thousand times simpler than a standard reset. So if I look at a, you know, a, you know, for our audience out there, a car engine, just think of all the parts with valves and lifters and camshafts and everything else, all those things that can go wrong. You've got like two parts, is that right? Two main big parts, yes, the oscillators moving sideways. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then we have the power electronics that convert uh, low frequency AC power that comes out of these oscillators, converts it to DC and then back to AC to get your 480 volt, 60 hertz. These are the main components of the, of the linear generator. It's beauty, it's simplicity, right? And it's, and it's really enabled by the advances in controls and power electronics over the last 10, 15 years. Okay, so now you got me also super confused, so I have to clarify something. So it's not a combustion engine, right? So it's it's not, not in the same world as turbines and recips. It's not an electrochemical fuel cell, so you know, you know, those guys. So I am interested in two three aspects. Number one is does it 
what is it or how is it categorized so I know whether or not I get an investment tax credit on it? Yeah, I can I can take a first stab at it, Jeff, and then you can add to it. So yes, you can qualify for an investment tax credit uh, because of our emissions are so low that we're treated like a fuel cell from an emissions perspective. So we get a lot of the tax incentives that the government gives to fuel cells. So you can qualify for a 30% ITC with the main. So it's a fuel cell in the context that it's a a non I uh, use the word combustion, it's a non-combustion chemical reaction. Fuel cells are basically just chemical reaction, typically electrochemical reaction, but but because it's a chemical reaction and not a combustion, there's no you know flame front or something like that, the IRS or the treasury or whomever considers it a fuel cell. So it comes under the standard, would that be 30% ITC? Yeah, yeah. If you if you look up the um, the updated IRA language uh, for for ITC guidance on fuel cells, we're actually in the same sections now. They've basically just added or mechanical linear generators, you know, to those to that language there. Okay, so your standard box is two hundred and thirty kilowatts, which is under the one meg uh, requirement for prevailing wage. Uh, so we're at 30 percent. I have to ask the question, right? Is the domestic content there to get me to 40? <laughs> at, at the moment, no. Um, you know, when they updated the language, they also, you know, introduced some new requirements around um, what qualifies as domestic content. Um, so we're working on it. But right now, our, our base case is, is a 30 percent tax credit. OK, so. Uh, you said emissions are much lower, and I think you specifically were talking about NOx. How does it relate to um, different locations in the United States, especially those that we always have trouble with, non-attainment zones? So how, how hard is it to get it air permitted? And does the AHJ freak out because he's never seen one of these things before or something? How easy is it to permit and get into operation? It's, it's much easier than your other traditional sources of energy like gensets because we're, our NOx levels are so low, we don't usually have a problem in non-attainment zones. Our, you know, the, the, pro the biggest challenge we see in working outside of California is a lot of, uh, you know, the AHJs are not familiar with our technology. So we just simply have to educate them. And we have a dedicated air permitting team that just works with the AHJs to explain to them the technology and how it works and all of that. In California, a lot of the HJs already know us, so we don't really have a lot of issues in California. Uh, we're also starting to do projects in the East Coast. We have projects in Florida. So where we're present and HJs are coming familiar with it, no problem. Like I said, there is no technical reason that prevents us. Actually, we're better suited in non-attainment zones than turbines and gensets uh, because of how low our NOx levels are. Right. For most applications, are any emission uh, any emission controls required at all? Not for NOx, right? Uh, I, as Jeff, I don't know. Like as far I, I haven't seen any after treatment needed in any of our projects. Mm -hmm. We usually we usually don't have a problem with meeting the emissions targets in, in a project. Yeah, I mean the only thing that could come to mind for me is understanding the chemistry would be whether your CO levels were you know, high and you needed to do some post oxidation. But uh, I, I think you guys are pretty much like it comes right out of the, the system and there's no there's no catalyst. There's no oxy. There's any of that. that. That's that's right. And, you know, obviously, the, when it comes to CO2, right, it depends on the fuel that you're using. So uh, if you're using pipeline gas or you know, traditional fossil fuel, you'll, you'll have CO2. So we're still not solving that problem. But if you're using renewable natural gas or green propane or green hydrogen, then obviously you don't have to worry about the CO2 uh, issue as well. So where we really, I think, compete mainly uh, with other energy sources and where the biggest advantage we have is our very low NOx emissions. Very similar, like I said, to a fuel cell, but we're uh, our 
cost and price is is much lower than a fuel cell. Uh, I'm going to throw a real tough curveball, <laughs> chemistry curveball in here, right? You mentioned biogas. One of the challenges of biogas, especially if it's coming from municipality, you know, municipal wastewater treatment, is siloxanes. And they can be incredibly damaging, especially to valves and things in a recip. Given your low temperature chemical reaction, are you almost impervious to siloxanes? I can take that one. Um, no, we do. <laughs> we, we do need uh, for for some landfill and biodigester gases, biogases generally, uh, we usually use off the shelf pretreatment uh, for siloxanes. Um, we did we did run some tests, you know, years ago just to see what would happen. And yeah, the siloxanes did over time, you know, start to uh, cause some premature wear um, on the oscillators. So yeah, we use standard pretreatment. Um, <laughs> Same as everybody else, right? <laughs> Same as everybody else. I think the key difference is um, comparing us to say a fuel cell, we can run on a really broad range of purities. We don't need a high purity gas, you know, to run the linear generator. So we're more similar to say a natural gas engine in that way. Does the system, does it, you would say you could literally fuel switch sort of on the fly. Do you have to tell the system what the fuel is, or does it understand it from its own characteristics? It, it'll detect that. Yeah, it can detect. You know, the we're running it at, on a twelve hertz cycle, so twelve times per second is what you know mm -hmm. the oscillator is operating at. The power electronics are operating at five thousand hertz, so they can detect very quickly what the optimal temperature and compression ratio is for whatever fuels being being introduced there. So <laughs> so as long as it's combustible, you can put it in there, it'll figure it out, kind of, yeah. sort of, right? Yeah. There may, so there may be one or two cycles. There may be one or two cycles that are not optimal, but it'll very quickly figure out what is the, you know, what is the exact um, compression ratio for that fuel. So if I'm a buyer and I own one of these, in a sense, from a fuel perspective, I am sort of future proofed, right? Meaning like I can put this in place, run today on natural gas. I get notification that they're going to start blending hydrogen into my natural gas. I don't have to worry about anything. I literally don't have to worry about anything because it'll adopt, adapt on that. Over time, that percentage of hydrogen goes up until it's 100%. I really don't have to do anything. That's right. I mean, that's that's the main advantage we have, uh, right? So, unlike other technologies, right? You, it's 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 hard. I mean, you, I'm familiar with fumigation and dual fuels and all that stuff, right? It's it's not easy, and a lot of OEMs don't offer it for that reason. It has a lot of complexity. It violates warranty and. Because you know people are tempering with the with the with the genset controls or the engine controls, and there are a lot of implications to that. You don't have to worry about any of that with with a linear generator. It is designed to be fuel flexible, and because of that, a lot of the customers, whether it's like you know a large data center, uh, industrial application, and industrial application is a perfect one, right? They may have pipeline gas, they may have propane, they may have hydrogen. So it gives them more options. So if you don't have gas, you can simply just switch to propane or switch to hydrogen and then go back to, ga to gas when you have it, right? So that fuel flexibility gives you that you know, comfort and redundancy that you need in, in any reliable power system. All right, I'm going to throw a real tough one at you here. So I, of course, preface this whole conversation with this is the newest thing. It's super exciting. You know, we haven't had something for 60 years, all of that. That's fantastic. But why? What is missing in the current generation of generators that prompted the founders to, to literally bring this to market? You had said linear generators have been around, but nobody's actually, they didn't have the electronics and technology to, to do it. Why now? And what, you know, what's, what's the problem 
that this generator is addressing that is unaddressed by everybody else? Jeff, you wanna, I can answer, but I want to make sure Jeff also has enough time. Uh, Scott, you, you got the gray beard, Jeff, so you're, you're this is more the, the, the wise man here, right? I mean, the, the founders, um, what, they, what, what they saw coming was more and more renewables on the grid, and they saw a, you know, a really dramatic need to be able to firm these renewable assets and you know developed a generator that is a cost effective low or zero carbon solution uh you know that can firm any other variable resources okay so let's that get can, I, can yeah. i add yeah, yeah let yeah. me add let, let me add to that so so there's the you know increased penetration of renewables right which is making the grid unstable and the other thing is you have this fast, you know, this fast growing electric vehicle charging problem that the grid has, right? So the grid, it's not just about power generation, it's about distribution, transmission. You can you have all these big metropolitan areas that are switching quick to electric vehicle charging and the grid can't keep up. So you're going to need distributed generation. The problem with distributed generation is typically if it's renewable, it's not dispatchable. And if it's if it's like a dispatchable, traditional dispatchable source, it's not clean, right? So having the ability to, to run, you know, load follow, dispatch, be high efficiency, flexible fuel, gives you all the a lot of options for customers to actually solve their power needs because the grid is not able to do so in a lot of cases. Right? Yeah, and that's a great point. I was literally this morning, I have, was on, uh, um, I had a conversation with an EV charging network in New York City, right? And they're literally discussing the issues with grid can't handle it. We're having to do, you know, distributed gen, but oh, it's a non-attainment zone. <laughs> it's like over and over and over again. So, um, Totally get it. So let me ask it from this perspective of how it compares. Let's let's just talk straight efficiency. So straight efficiency, ramp, load follow, block load, black, all the things that typically come up with a with a generator. So let's start with efficiency. All right. Let me talk about let's do this, Jeff. I'll talk about the generator, and then you can also talk about how it compares with fuel cells. So we'll tag team on this. Since I spent a lot of my career in the generator uh, business, yeah. like the traditional generator. So efficiency-wise, it's higher, much better than a reset engine generator. Um, so we all know like the reset engine generators, you know, like diesels around like 30%, trich burn gas, you know, you know, low theories. A lean burn gas engine is probably going to be upper 30s, low 40s. Uh, linear generator on traditional pipeline gas has an average electric efficiency output of 45%. 45, okay. 40, 45%. And then, and it, if, if you know, so it, it's really all about how much you can compress the, the gas, right? So if you're running an ammonia, you can actually compress it more and your efficiency is even higher than 45%. It could be one or two percentage points. I think 47% is what we did in some, some tests. If it's hydrogen, you can't compress it as much. So it's maybe 42, 43%. So, but 45% is kind of the average uh, uh, efficiency number that we use in a lot of our traditional pipeline natural gas projects. So better efficiency, lower o &M, uh, against the generator because you don't have oil or filters or spark plugs or any of that. So you can definitely, you know, our O&M cost is much, much better. So our LCOE, levelized cost of energy, if you're running a lot, if you're, this is supposed to be a prime power energy source. It's not really, we're not really targeting backup power only. That's not our market. What we're going for is a prime power application where we can either replace the utility or act as the utility until you have that utility connection. So we'll run years, right? And we'll run thousands of hours per year. With that scenario and that use case, we will have the lowest levelized cost of energy compared to engines and generators and turbines and 
fuel cells and all the other distributed energy resources on the market. Um, I, I, I'll let Jeff talk about how it compares with fuel cells as well, but do you have let questions on the generator? Take it with respect to, let's say, a recip. So if I assume, and just help me if my, my, my math is right, recip is going to average about 35% efficiency, you're at 45%. So they may say, well, it's 10% more efficient. Well, it's actually more like 28, 6% more efficient, right? 10 on top of 35, that 10 is like literally 25%. So it's a fairly big step in efficiency there, right? It does. Um, so, so now when I think of fuel cells, Jeff, I usually think of them a bit higher than that though, don't I? Yeah, most fuel cells are um, in the kind of 50 to 60 range, uh, typically guaranteed in the mid 50s. Um, so yeah, so we're, uh, below a fuel cell in most cases, um, but we don't degrade. So that's one advantage. Uh, the other key advantage is that we can load track. You know, most fuel cells like to run at a set power point. Um, linear generators can turn on and off. They can track building load. They can work in parallel with solar on the rooftop, you know, Tesla battery packs, whatever it is. Uh, so a lot more flexibility in, in the dispatch. And I just want to clarify, right? So yep. you have PEM fuel cells, you have solid oxide fuel cells, right? So we typically mainly compete with solid oxide fuel cells. So when we talk about fuel cells, a lot of times we're basically referring to the solid oxide fuel cell. Now we know that the PEM fuel cell can do load following, and you know, but it is lower efficiency than a solid oxide fuel cell, and it has to run on 100% hydrogen. Right? It right. doesn't have that fuel flexibility. So this is why we don't talk much about PEM fuel cells, because we didn't really see PEM fuel cells in the power well, generation. Well, there's no markets. hydrogen infrastructure. The hydrogen infrastructure yeah. is not there. This is why we're specifically comparing with solid oxide fuel cells. I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah, good clarification. So you get into an elevator, and somebody else walks in with you and says, geez, I'm in the market for a generator. What's your unique value proposition to this person? Yeah, I, I'll tell you what I say. And I'm sure <laughs> Jeff you has, you know, maybe another pitch. But for me, because I understand the space for now 20 years, right? So I, I quickly go to, okay, what do we have to offer that they don't have? We can give them clean, low carbon power at a very competitive, you know, cost of energy compared to the grid. So we're really competing with the electric utility grid in a lot of these applications. Mm -hmm. In California, in the Northeast, the cost of electricity is just keeps going up, 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 right? And it's becoming really a problem for a lot of commercial and industrial customers. And we're mainly in the commercial industrial space. Our smallest kilowatt node is 230 kilowatts. So we don't do residential, right? Mm -hmm. So we target, CNI and we're starting to go after like utility front of the meter projects as well. But most of our activity is behind the meter CNI for now. And the problem trying to solve is like the energy costs, right? We can, you can do energy arbitrage any, and we target areas where the cost is more than, you know, 10 cents, 12 cents per kilowatt hour, which California and Northeast and a lot of other states fall in, in that category, right? And we can really help them save a lot of money without sacrificing re resiliency and reliability. We, this technology is tested and proven. We have 20 years of runtime, equivalent runtime on this, on these uh, you know, units that we have in the field, running more than three years, 24 seven. So it's, it's no longer a theoretical technology. It is in the field, it is running, it works. And we have data to prove that you can save money for the customers. And you don't have to worry about the NOx emissions and all the other things that you would have to worry, uh, you know, with if you if you were running with a traditional like lean burn gas, Gensat or a turbine or some of the more traditional on-site generators. Yeah, so, I would maybe add a little bit to that. I mean, if, if somebody got in an elevator with me and said they're looking at backup generators, I would say, great. And, you know, what else are you trying to solve at your facility? You know, I think what Sam is getting at is that 
a little more expensive than a recip. So if you need a backup generator that's only going to run for a few hours or a couple days a year, we're probably not the most economic product out there. But if you have peak demand charges that you're trying to, to mitigate or even, you know, prime power costs that, you know, that we can uh, improve on, then that's kind of a perfect combination. Some, you know, either peak hour shaving, prime power, you know, maybe it varies between those two, depending on the season and, uh, and the rate that you're on. And you have an asset that can also be used as, uh, you know, backup power to replace a diesel gen set or, or some other asset. And I wanted, I wanted to show one more slide, but I think because right. we, we've been talking, yeah, we've been like kind of talking about this slide for a while and just kind of, it sums it up, right? So if, if you actually can see this slide, <clears throat> this shows, right, the linear generator, which, again, a reminder, we qualify for the 30% investment tax credit, right, mm -hmm. which even makes our CapEx even lower. Uh, even without the ITC, we're, you know, much better than a uh, uh, hydrogen fuel cell. So basically, you know, low CapEx, Low apex, low opex, because we don't have a lot of rotating parts, spark plugs. We don't have oil, food, all that stuff, right? We talked about the efficiency, so very similar in efficiency to you know, it's in between a natural gas kind of a lean burn engine and a solid oxide fuel cell, but I would say forty-five plus percent efficiency, right? And, and pipeline gas. We talked about emissions dispatchability, right? The fact that we can turn on and off as many times as you want us, this is something that solid oxide fuel cells cannot do. And we're not like a battery where you can only run us for a couple hours. You can actually run as long as you want, right? It's like, as long as you have fuel coming into the reaction zone, we're good, right? So we are dispatchable and that dispatchability is very important to firming a lot of projects we have, they have solar on the roof. And the use case is basically they need something to firm the solar, right? And the only al alternative is either a battery, which only can run a couple hours, right? And the business case may not make sense. Or you have a traditional gen set, but, you know, for emissions reasons, it, it, it doesn't work because it's in a non-attainment zone. Or when you add the after treatment, the capex becomes so high. So because of all of that, we solve that that you know renewable firming issue with our dispatchability. And we can you asked about how fast can we pick up load? We can pick up load in 10, 20 seconds. Uh, and we can ramp up and down and load follow. We can be grid connected, we can island, we can do a lot of the things that a traditional genset can do, which a solid oxide fuel cell cannot do. So in, in one way, I get a little schizophrenic here because I have one of you talking about prime power, then it's dispatchable, and then it's load follow, then it's firming. Jeff mentions backup generators. Yeah, you could do it, but we're probably not as economical. Then we talk black start. So it sounds a little bit like you can do everything application wise, there are just some fits that create more value than others. So you could be a backup generator, but given your price point and all the other values, it's not a good application, but it's cur it's certainly functional. Meaning like there, the only, and I don't mean this in any negative way, the only compromise is a price point, not a feature function, right? It will load follow, it will block load, it will do all the things that most people can't do <laughs> all of them at the same time right that that's correct and this is why i started by highlighting the focus on this is a mainly prime power solution uh you know if, if someone just needs a backup power solution and there is no business case for prime power and their utility rate is really low then this is not the right solution right then traditional backup energy you know gen sets will do the job uh it we really add the most value where you have like high electricity costs, so you don't have power and you need to run thousands of hours per year. Or to, as Jeff said, you can even run 20% of capacity factor. It doesn't have to be a 90 plus percent capacity factor. You know, we just have to work with you, the developer, and we're, you know, maybe I'll use this platform to just encourage all the developers out there. If you want to work with us on these projects, 
please reach out to us, right? And we will work with you to evaluate the business case and tell you where it makes sense and it doesn't make sense. I want to go back to something you said that kind of scared me a bit. <laughs> Uh, let me start off this way is for those of us in, in the audience who aren't responsible for maintenance and things of generators, they are maintenance intensive. We got, as we saw you were mentioning, we've got, you know, oil, we got filters, got to keep them warm, literally, you know, uh, every day of the year. And I've always been shocked at how expensive spark plugs <laughs> are for a natural gas generator, I mean, literally thousands of dollars a year. But in general, I really don't have much downtime on a generator. Uh, I, I have some substantial maintenance expense, but I don't have a lot of downtime. You said something that I need to understand a little bit more is like the air bearings. And again, I go back like you got like two moving parts. That's fantastic. But of those two moving parts, you've got four seals I, bearings that need to be replaced each month. Talk to me a little bit more about that in the sense that if, you know, I'm talking to a potential customer and I'd say, yeah, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread, does all these things, you know, and its capacity factor is 75% because one week a month, I've got to be replacing the bearings, right? So help me to understand how complex, how much time it takes. And this is something that might in fact be, you know, my maintenance department could do. Yeah. Um I'll, I'll take a first stab at it, Jeff. Feel free to jump in. But it is not really that difficult to replace it. Anyone with basic training from Mainspring can do it. Um, and it's and like I said, you don't have to shut down the both oscillators, right? You can service, you know, one half. Yeah, right? When you talk about an oscillator, shut down both. Uh, within your system, there are two. 115 kilowatt units. Correct. To me, each unit has two oscillators, right? Mm. Okay. Yeah. 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 So if I'm replacing the bearings on one unit, okay, there's two units. Correct. Can I run? Can the so, other unit be running? So, well? Sorry. <laughs> no, that's a great. Uh, thank maybe you. We for, should put the, maybe we should no, put back. Yeah. On. No, I, I agree. So, uh, <laughs> Basically, you're right. So there are two, think of it as two generators in that 20-foot container box. Okay. okay. The two generators will have four oscillators, right? Mm -hmm. So you can, you can service one generator and keep the other generator. Each generator is 115 kilowatts. Together, they give you 230 kilowatts. So you can actually service one of the generators and you don't have to completely lose power or shut down, right? Completely, and and uh, and that service for the that CM that we're talking about doesn't take a long time. It's you know two hours kind of is what we're thinking, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and then you just yeah, it's it's not really that complicated. You just need to have the right tools to be able to pull the generator out and replace the the seals and some okay. basic training. Yeah. Is that a fixed maintenance schedule item or does the unit come back and say, hey, it's time to replace? It's based on run hours. Yeah. It's based on run hours? Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. It's just, it's a, it's a graphite seal ring, you know, it's sacrificial and yeah, we just schedule replacement of those based on runtime. So I, I threw you in the elevator and said, give me the, the value proposition. Um, you're in you're in city and or some area. How would you describe the best customer candidate for your technology? What I want is make sure that our audience, you know, comes back and says, geez, this sounds like the greatest thing since sliced bread. It's low emissions, it's low, lowest cost of energy. It's got to be perfect for everything. Never true, but it can be perfect for everything. Give me a couple of applications, use cases where this is absolutely the slam dunk. So that somebody in the audience could go, you know, that's me. I should talk to these people. How would you uh, describe that particular application? Jeff, since you lead CNI sales, I'll let you okay. start. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess I would say 
there's no one perfect application, right? So maybe I'll go through a few different use cases that, that come to mind as being, you know, what we've seen as the most exciting sort of slam dunk um, projects. Uh, one is, you know, biogas, you know, so we've worked with municipal utilities, you have a landfill gas or a digester gas, it's not being utilized um, or monetized in some way, we can, we can use it and produce. So you, can, you can use it even at a low wobby number. Pardon me? Low wobby number, low, low BTU per cubic foot. Yeah, anything with a methane content of about 45% or higher. Okay. Yeah, so uh, so that, that's a great use case. And then depending on where you are, there may be additional incentives for that. For instance, in California, uh, we can qualify for the SGIP incentives. So between that and the federal tax incentives, you know, more than half of the project CapEx is being paid for. Uh, so, so that's one example. Um, another is sort of what we're calling in turn, you know, speed to power. Um, you know, we're doing a project with Prologis. Uh, you know, they need to install uh, truck charging infrastructure, you know, for their customers, uh, clients. And the utility is telling them it's going to be three years and $10 million in upgrades. We're doing a completely grid independent, multi megawatt charging station start to finish in nine months. So that's another fantastic use case. And it's, you know, on top of the, you know, them being able to do it, obviously much more quickly, uh, you know, the LCOE is comparable to what they would have been paying for utility power, apart from the upgrade costs. So that's another great example. Maybe one that's, you know, just more common that would probably just resonate with a lot of people on the call is just, you know, you're in a fairly high cost power region, you know, that can be West Coast, Northeast, some pockets in between. Um, you want to lower your power cost, you know, some combination of kilowatt hours and KW demand. We can do that in a lot of regions today. And we can also, you know, work on sustainability goals. So if you have, you know, particular scope one, scope two emissions targets, um, you know, we can, you know, we can help work on that. Um, even running on regular pipeline natural gas, we're cleaner than the grid in a lot of regions. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd say those are probably the three, the three prime cases there. And of course, in, in that last example, if backup power is, you know, an added value, then that's, you know, something that's, uh, you know, that helps kind of sell it internally for, yeah. for our customers. And maybe let's just add one yeah. quick comment on the last thing he said. So if you just need backup power, we already said this is not the right one. But if you're going to use this generator, you can also avoid the cost of a backup generator, right? So you can actually use the utility as a backup if you're grid connected. Uh, and, and, and that's a very common use case that we're, like, a lot of our customers are entertaining. And uh, now, obviously, sometimes you have life safety load and you need to start in 10 seconds and things of that nature. So there are definitely use cases that favor a traditional diesel genset or a rich brand gas uh, genset, right? But if you are running prime, just, you know, will be the on-site generator and you can avoid that backup power. And I think if you add that into the modeling and calculation, that even improves your LCE or LCOE further, right? And that's something to think of. Yeah, the other thing I could see is, you know, typically we we use generators to do peak shaving, but, you know, in, in general, we do it off of the transmission side, the cap and trans side, because that's the biggest hit, but it's also only four hours or five hours a year or something like that. Whereas the demand charges for your local distribution utility is whatever happens for 15 minutes, whenever it happens during the month, um, you guys can be on sort of 24 seven and then respond to that and say, I, we're going to keep our load that's to the grid below something, uh, some setting, and then you'll flex up and down to in, ensure that and reduce those distribution charges as well. 
Correct. You said it perfectly. And then the other thing is I wanted to also say is, let's say you're running lightly loaded. A lot of uh, traditional chain sets will struggle with that. You have what, you know, what stacking and, you know, a lot of issues. You don't have to worry about any of that with the linear generator. It can run very lightly loaded and go up to full loads and back to lightly loaded. And you, so you don't have to worry about wet stacking or a lot of the other issues. Um, and then I think I think the other thing I'll just say, um, you know, we 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 also are looking into making bigger units uh, mm -hmm. soon, right? So we have 230 kilowatts now. Next week, next year, we're going to go up to 250, right? And then in a few years, we're going to go up to the megawatt uh, range. So uh, 230 is just the beginning. It's not the only product we will have. But you mentioned years. the multi megawatt projects. I'm assuming you can run these in parallel, right? Yes. Yeah, you can. Yeah, and actually, I have a picture like, uh, you know, you can actually put them to create multiple megawatt solutions for larger megawatt scale like uh you, you know utility projects uh, data centers we actually have a whole team that's just focusing in front of the meter applications now getting down to what always is the dangerous of the fine print so it's a new technology it's linear fewer moving parts looks wonderful and everything else any tricky or special installation requirements or something like you know, it's got to be flat within, you know, two nanometers or something or seismic considerations or anything else, or an installation is pretty much the same as any generator. It's actually easier to install it, right? Because we, it comes already prepackaged and like all ready to go in a 20 foot container. You just have to put it on the concrete pad, right? And so a lot of the mechanical plumbing work that you traditionally see in a traditional gen set, you don't have to worry about it here. It already comes prepackaged. I'm not sure, if Jeff, you want to add anything to that. No, well. I think I think you hit it. Yeah. If you wanted to maybe pull up a slide that just shows the uh, you know the box yeah. that's for anybody that hasn't been to the website, it might be helpful. Sounds to okay. Get the more Yeah. And I know we have only a few minutes, and I see some comments as well, David, in the chat. I want to answer. Oh, since you're looking at them, I'll let you answer them. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, this, let's start with the box. This is your 20-foot container, right? 230 kilowatt in a box. You can put multiple boxes together, and this is a rendering of a 9-megawatt plant that we're working on that will be running on ammonia. Mm -hmm. uh, we can, like I said, natural gas, biogas, hydrogen capabilities. Uh, Resiliency is a key thing. We can we're grid parallel or islanded. Uh, permis permitting, air permitting is usually not a challenge for us because of our very low NOx emissions levels. We are UN listed and we have 24 seven monitoring. Actually the amount of sensors and monitoring we have on this machine is amazing. And uh, it's probably, it's using one of the best monitoring technologies and platforms I've seen in, in my 20 years in this uh, this industry. There is financing. We don't have to, if you don't have money to, for the CapEx, we have partners that can finance these projects and sell you, uh, you know, 10, 15, 20 year PPAs. Uh, and uh, yeah, we have, you know, relationships with the fuel suppliers as well. But this is what it looks like. And this is an example of, you know, how you can stack them together or, and we're also looking into stacking on top of each other, right? So that's also coming soon. Uh, one of the questions uh, I think, uh, w w it was an interesting question, is on the emissions, is it only CO2 or is it syngas? Let me um, sort of poke at you a little bit. Um, I think Jeff, I think it was you who said that not all the fuel is, is consumed which makes people think, therefore, the, you know, the exhaust is going to include unburned hydrocarbons. I don't think that's the case. I think the um, uh, your emissions are just standard sort of CO2, whatever residual oxygen is in the system, it, it was unoxidized, un uncombined, and N2. You don't have NOx in there. So... Um, I'm going to answer the question, I think, is no, it's not syngas. Syngas, typically a combination of CO and hydrogen things. It's going to be a standard 
CO2, nitrogen, and that's it. I think that's correct. Yeah, yeah, thanks, David. Uh, we're some with other questions, yeah. <laughs> yes, so there are three comments I see in the chat, two from Joaquin. Uh, do we, can we get it in Puerto Rico? Currently, we're mainly selling in the U.S., but I, yeah, bring us the projects and we'll be happy to look at it. Puerto Rico is very close by, so we'll definitely explore it. We're not at the point where we can do projects in like Asia and Europe and other countries. So we'll need a very good business case to do something outside of North America. Uh, and then the other question from Joaquin was about the warranty. Uh, you know, we, we offer five-year O&M contracts and this uh, machine, and we have the standard, you know, like one-year warranties. And But we, we stand behind the product. We have high confidence in it now that we have more than three years of machines in the field running, you know, 24-7. Uh, and uh, you don't have to worry about, you know, we'll, you'll have, we'll have a, an O&M support uh, around every machine we sell. And then the last comment I see is from my Michael. Uh, I think the comparison with solid oxide, I think this is the biggest like game changer. Is like, I think there's a lot of skepticism, honestly, on fuel cells, and I fully understand it, right? Um, I, think, I think this new technology, think of it as, I think it's gonna really replace the fuel cell in a lot of applications. That's, that's how I see it, especially in the power generation market. Right. And uh, I think the main competitor uh, that we see in the market is not usually the gen sets. Right. It's the, the solid dioxide fuel cells. Right. So uh, that's how we define competition. It's uh, or the utilities. Right. Like in a lot of cases, the utilities are just so expensive. The rates just keep going up and up and we can help, help our customers solve their energy cost problems with our solution. All right, I'm going to do a quick wrap up and then I have one last question because we're running at the top of the hour. <laughs> so uh, quick wrap up. We've got high efficiency, 45%. We've got fuel flexibility. Anything that's gaseous and burned basically is acceptable, but it's dynamically determined, meaning you can fuel switch, reblend anything. There's no pre-programming requirement to do that. We have very few moving parts, therefore we have higher, I'm gonna say higher uptime, lower maintenance uh, costs and expensive expenses. It is dispatchable, it is black start, it is load following. Um, it can do basically anything that any other generator can do, only better, cheaper, faster. And you said it's gonna have the lowest levelized cost of energy out there in the market today in a prime power application, under, understand that. You're gonna be less expensive, if, if I'm right, you're less expensive than the fuel cells, at least Correct. It's, it's about anybody out there, less expensive, maybe a little bit more expensive than a standard recip or turbine. But again, you also have literally no emissions in the sense that yes, there's CO2. Yeah, unless you're burning hydrogen or ammonia, you're gonna have CO2, but you're not gonna have the NOx you're compliant with all air permits throughout the country, non-attainment zones, not an issue. What did I miss in that quick wrap up? And then I have one last question for you. Uh, that was a great uh, wrap up. Jeff, yeah, anything else so my last question yeah. is, what didn't I ask you that I should have asked you? Uh, one thing I think we didn't mention, it, you know, just going over the product reviews, it's a 20 year product. Um, that is the, the design life. So in a prime power application. So I yeah. always think of prime power as, let's say, 8,500 hours a year, 20 years. So we're talking what? What does that come out to be? 20, 30,000 out runtime at right. least? Yeah, okay. 20 years at a high capacity factor. Yeah, yeah this, 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 is, this is really designed to run constantly. It is designed for power gen applications. I'll end maybe with my last comments. This is not a technology that we adapted or took from a transportation, from trucks or from you know mining equipment and then make it work in a generated application. This was designed from the get-go, targeting the power generation market to accelerate uh, you know, a low carbon economy with distributed generation. This is the mission we're, we're I got One last question, apologies. Somebody came in and said, yeah, Love what I'm hearing. How noisy is it? 
because you know we've got people from the hospital that oh this sounds really really good but you know it's, it's a nursing home it's an elder it's, care it's, community it's, it's much quieter than a traditional genset uh less you know seven seventy db is not an issue for us and we can have this discussion standing right next to a linear generator panel. fantastic uh it is at the top of the hour uh, Jeff, Wassam, thank you so much for taking the time today and telling us about this exciting new technology. For 60 years, we got a new technology. Mm -hmm. So, again, anyone, uh, if you didn't uh, had a question or something and we didn't address it, please send it to us in the comments and we'll get it right back to you. Uh, it is recorded if you want to, uh, to grab it. It's on our LinkedIn page. It will also get posted to our YouTube channel. And I'm sure that Wassam and his team at Mainspring will post it as well. So thanks everybody. And most importantly, have the happiest of Thanksgivings. Take care. Yeah. Happy Thank Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank you.